Good morning. I'm Jack Martin. I want to welcome you to the Breakthrough Advisor podcast. Uh, I serve as uh, InsureMark's virtual CMO, and uh, Breakthrough Advisor podcast is where uh, our leading advisors come to get insights, coaching, strategy to help them level up their practice. And so today we've got Brittany Hodick. Uh, she is uh, the author of The Superfan, uh, and she she has a lot to say about what customer experience looks like. Hey, how are you doing, Brittany? Hey, Jack, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me today. So you're connecting in from Nashville, is that right? That's right. I'm in Franklin, Tennessee, just south of Nashville. Awesome. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about your journey uh, and kind of what, what Super Fans is all about. Sure. Well, Superfans is really all about transforming from a commodity provider to a category of one. And this is an idea that came to me when I was working in the music industry. So I grew up in Oklahoma. We were talking right before we started recording. I was a huge Texas Rangers fan because, you know, obviously there's there's no major league baseball teams in Oklahoma. And I really wanted to work either for the Texas Rangers or in the music industry. Like that was it when I was a little kid, I wanted to do one or the other. And when I was 16 years old, I went to job shadow for a day for a school assignment at the local radio station. And I said, please give me a job. I'll do anything at all. Um, I was so excited because the AM station there was where they broadcast Eric Nadell and Brad Cham doing the Texas Ranger broadcast. And so I was like, oh, maybe they'll hire me in the AM station. Uh, but I actually got a job as a mascot for one of the FM stations, like wearing a bee costume. And I thought it was like the coolest job ever. It was so fun. You know, I got free CDs and, you know, got to hang out at the station all day. Um, and after about six months, the promotions manager said, you know, I keep seeing ads for this Bridget Jones diary movie, and I don't know what it's all about, but I just keep thinking we have a Brittany Jones and I keep seeing Bridget Jones. What could we do and call it Brittany Jones diary? And I said, well, you know, you're always trying to get more people on the radio station website. What if I just sort of like interviewed the bands when they came to town and wrote about it and we could record little drops on the station. And she said, oh yeah, like that other movie I keep seeing ads for that almost famous movie. Yeah, that's starting to get some Oscar buzz. Let's do that. So as a 17 year old kid, it became my job all of a sudden to literally hang out with rock stars and brag about it on the internet. Like that was, that was my job, which you know, ruined any chances of me ever getting like a traditional corporate job. So from that point forward, I was like, okay, it's entertainment industry or bust. I worked at several record labels and entertainment agencies. And of course, you know, I was doing the radio thing for several years and just loved it. And over the years, I became obsessed with why some bands would go viral and other bands would go bust. Like what was happening that was making some continue to grow their fan bases and others who had, you know, arguably equally as good songs or equally as good budgets just sort of fade away. And what I started to see again and again and again was that the bands that were growing in their fan base were the ones who cared the most about their fans, the ones who were staying to like sign autographs after the show or like you know, hang out before the show, invite people to the sound check. And they were the ones that, you know, there'd be like 400 people. And then they'd come back six months later and there'd be 800 people because everybody was bringing a friend. And then there'd be 2000 people six months after that. And so I became really fascinated by that. I went back to school. I got a master's degree in marketing and consumer behavior to really study that link. And what I started to see was that the exact same things that were true for entertainers were true of brands and were true of entrepreneurs. Anyone who wants to grow their business, who wants to go from commodity provider to category of one, has to show that love to their audience first, has to prove why they are deserving of having those super fans. And so I became really fascinated by like, could we take what was working in the world of entertainment, the like razzle dazzle and sparkle and apply that to non-entertainment careers to create rock stars out of people who were working in service professions. So um, that is what I've dedicated the past decade or so of my life to is that intersection uh, between, you know, entertainment and commerce and this idea that everyone can create super fans, whether you're a rock star or not. 
Well, that's really super interesting. And um, so, so we're talking today to our, our uh, top financial advisors. So mm-hmm. how, does, how does this translate to them? What should they be thinking about when they think about super fans? Because um, I don't think there are a lot of groupies for financial advisors. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. But the best financial advisors, what do they have? They have people who would never go anywhere else. They have people who are telling their friends, you've got to meet my guy, Ethan. You've got to meet, you know, my girl, Nicole. They, they have those people who are out there advocating on their behalf. So I define a super fan as a customer who is so delighted by their experience with you that they become an enthusiastic advocate. When they have the opportunity to bring business your way, either through a referral or an introduction or a review, they want to do that. So financial advisors can absolutely create those kinds of customers. And I like to say that super fans are created at the intersection of your story and every customer story. So I don't know, Jack, if you want to get into my five-part framework of how I recommend people actually create the super fans, but it all starts with your story. So as a financial advisor, you're living in a commodity space. You have got lots and lots of other people who on paper do a very similar or exact exact same thing as you do. So you've got to differentiate yourself, both for your existing customers, but more importantly, for your prospects. You've got to prove to them that you're not like the other guys. And when you can't make claims legally about, you know, what the performance is going to be in the future, because you don't know, you don't have a crystal ball, the way you differentiate yourself is by making them understand who you are and why you're best positioned to serve them. And, you know, if you think about Anytime you're looking for someone, you want to get somebody who has expertise, but who also is going to be right for you. And that's true of any service provider that you're looking for, but especially when you're finding someone that's hopefully going to have like a decades long relationship with you. You want to pick not just anyone, but the right someone for you. And that's why it's so important to be dialed in on what your story is, what your superpower is, why you're doing financial advising in a world where you could do anything at all. Why did you pick this? And why are you so passionate about using your gifts and your strengths to help your customers lead a better life? So I think that's the S in your super framework. Uh, and, and the U is for understanding the consumer. And, and it's really the intersection of those two uh, uh, stories that that advisors should really understand if they're going to build a great experience, right? It absolutely is. Yes. The S is start with your story. The U is understand your customer story. And, you know, I joke sometimes, like, do you remember, Jack, the first time you saw one of your teachers outside of school? Oh, yes. Oh, and yes. did it like freak you out? Like what so, was that experience like for you? Um, so yes, it did freak me out. But it, it, the, the first time <laughs> I saw them at the market, but uh, I was on a trip. I, I was fortunate enough to travel to London to study at Cambridge. And uh, we're in London going to a show one night. And literally one of my high school teachers from San Diego, California, shows up at the show on in London. And so oh that gosh. was a total freak out moment. So yes, I, I get it. When they are outside <laughs> of their normal, when they are way, when they're out of the, the continent, that's normal. So yes, I get what you're saying. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so the reason I love to ask people about the first time they saw their teacher, obviously, like by the time you're in in college, you understand, you know, that teachers are people. But as children, oftentimes we don't think about that, right? Like we don't think about them existing outside of the confines of our classroom. And so when we see them in another context, it's like a, a pattern interrupt for us as a child. And the reason I bring that up is I think it's a great analogy to the way a lot of people treat their customers. They only think about them as this is my customer in a very sort of like one dimensional way. You're not thinking about the rest of their life, who they are, this full picture of them as a person and to be successful in any service industry. And especially as a financial advisor, it's critical to understand the totality of who your customer is. Like, what are they struggling with? What's the transfer? Information that they want to have in their lives. You know, what, what options are they considering for all the important decisions that await them? So when I talk about understanding your customer story, it's about having true curiosity and empathy that precedes the authority. Like, I love this quote by Teddy Roosevelt. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You've got to first show up with that empathy and that curiosity before you can assert yourself as the expert with the authority that's going to help them along. 
so that really is a trust building exercise, right? More than oh, a marketing 100%. exercise, right? Oh, a hundred percent. It's about truly caring about getting to know your customers as the people they are saying, you know, of the billions and billions of people on this planet, I am so privileged to be in a position to get to know this other human and caring about their family, their interests, their friends, their background, and all of that. Because not only does that allow you to forge a deeper relationship, but it allows you to do your job better because you get to know their preferences. You get to know, um, you know, their blind spots, their weaknesses, how they want information, how often they want information, which dovetails perfectly into the, to the third pillar of our supermodel, which is P, and P stands for personalize. And so it's all about taking everything that you've learned by getting to understand your customer more deeply and using that to create like a curated custom experience for them, the way you communicate, how often you communicate. Um, you know, do they like to have like, phone meetings or do they like to have video meetings? Do they want to meet with you once a month or are they like, just send me an email right before tax season? Like, what is that cadence in which they want to hear from you and how supported do they want to feel? And so that's all about, you know, combining what I like to call the high tech stuff with the high touch stuff, because when you can combine the high tech and the high touch, you create very high impact. So those personal experiences that are going to be memorable and meaningful for your customers. So I think a lot of uh, financial advisors I'm listening that are listening here, um, and, and I heard a group presenting yesterday who are just all stars. Um, I think they 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 are touching the tip of the iceberg on this. They talk about um, how, of course, they do birthday cards, they do anniversary cards, they do cakes, uh, they do client appreciation events, they do those kinds of things. Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, that's absolutely part of it, making them feel welcome, making them feel appreciated as a customer. Uh, but it's also it's also the things that you can do with technology, like how often are you sending them updates about their portfolio? And is that aligned with how often that they want to hear from you? Are you making it easy? Like if they want to get statements in the mail old school versus they want to be able to see everything on an app, you know, are you, are you giving them the education and the support that they need so that they can engage with you and with their money um, at the, at the intervals and in the, the ways in which they want to. So it's both sides of that. It's all of the things that you do to make someone feel welcome. It's also the, how can I build a journey that's going to support your needs so that you feel like you've got, you know, like access to everything on your own terms. It's, you know, I feel like sometimes people are like, oh, everything's so concierge. It's like white glove. We've got to do everything for you. And sometimes that white glove treatment can feel like white handcuffs, right? Like, you know, people are like, no, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want highly curated. I don't want to have to like call someone and wait and talk. I want to do everything on my own terms at two 30 in the morning. I want to be able to manage things on my own terms. So it's getting to understand what it is that every individual customer or client wants so that you can super serve them and meet their needs. And that's what the personalization is truly about is understanding that not every customer is the same and not every client you have is going to want the same experiences from you. So I think that that, um, I think advisors are probably thinking, you know, I do some of that at the beginning when I'm talking to folks, but really I think the opportunity for that persists, you know, as you talk about uh, doing reviews, you know, are you going to, does the client want semi-annual, annual, bi-monthly, you know, what's the frequency? Yeah, we want to get that. Um, and do they want to come into the office or are they happy with virtual and those kinds of things? I get that. But I think they also want to help curate what that agenda looks like. Uh, and, and, and I think advisors may soon have access to more tools to help them assess where their clients are, not just from a portfolio perspective, but, you know, from, from, you know, the, the, their, their mindset, their mentality, how they're feeling about um, what, what's going on in their lives. So it, it how do, how do how do you how do we integrate that is is that going down the 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 right path is are we thinking about that right yeah, absolutely. And having, you know, even something as simple as a questionnaire for your clients so that you can track, you know, 
things that are changing. Like maybe, maybe before they told you they plan to retire when they're 60, but they've had a couple of really great years. And now they're like, man, I think I can retire, you know, when I'm 54 and that's only two years away. So now I need to, you know, plan a little bit differently or, you know, maybe, maybe the kids that, you know, we thought were going to go to college have both decided to be entrepreneurs. So now we've got to figure out like what we're doing with all that 529 money that we've been saving for all of these years. So making sure that you're asking those life questions on a regular basis, not just like, oh, I did it five years ago. So, you know, I, I know what's going, what's going on. And that's why going back to the you, understanding your customer story, getting clarity on, you know, what it is that they want, what it is that every single client wants so that you can be alongside them helping and supporting, but you're not going to know what questions to ask if, you know, like three years from now, if you don't ask those questions today um, and take the time to really truly get to know them. So I recommend that everybody looks at their client intake questions and their client um, survey questions at least twice a year, like minimally two times a year. And you need to be looking at the questions that you're asking and the frequency with which you're asking them um, so that you can continue to provide the curated custom experiences that people are coming to expect. Because, you know, the thing about the world we're living in now, it's no longer just a service economy. It's really an experience economy. People are no longer differentiating the services from the products, right? It's all about the experience they have, how it feels to work with you, how you make them feel about that relationship at every touch point, whether it's an in-person meeting or a quick text message or a phone number. So being able to design and curate that experience so that when someone says, you know, hey, what's it like working with Andy? Someone says, oh, it's amazing. Let me tell you about all the ways Andy's great. Not like, oh, you know what? I think he's fine, but like, I never talk to the guy. Like I get a statement once a year and like maybe a birthday card, but I don't know. He's kind of like hands off. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so the, there's, you know, I, I I guess I can understand why uh, financial advisors maybe are reticent to, to engage with their customers about those matters frequently, but so, so what can, what advice can you give them to encourage them, you know, to be more uh, open to, to having those um, emotional conversations as opposed to just the analytical conversations? Well, so the first thing that I would say, and, you know, I, I wrote a book, as you mentioned, called Creating Super Fans, How to Turn Your Customers into Lifelong Advocates. And going back to the S part, one of the things that I talk about is getting aligned with what your own comfort level is, because the reality is the way that you personalize something is going to depend on both your story and your customer story. So all of these, all of these pillars of the supermodel are like nesting dolls. Each one builds on the one before. And what I would say to that is the start with your story. You've got to figure out your comfort level of how deep you want to go. And some people out there listening might be like, yeah, I want to be best friends with all of my clients. I want to know everything that's happening in their life. I want to support them. I want to know the teams their kids are playing on and like their hopes and dreams. And others might be saying, I don't want to do any of that. Like, I just want to know what your, what your, you know, finances look like and be able to like talk to you a couple of times a year. Neither is wrong. The secret is getting dialed in on which one you are so that you can go all in on that and use the knowledge that that's what you want to help attract the clients that are most in alignment with you. And of course you have a fiduciary responsibility to help anyone, but we all know that there are certain types of clients that we each like working with that fit our personality, that fit our skill set. Any advisor listening is probably like, yeah, the ones with like the most dollar signs, that is what I like the best. But getting clarity on the types of clients that you feel most alive and engaged and excited to work with and how telling your story is going to help attract more of that type of client because then your personalization is going to feel much more in align both with their needs and your desires. So, you know, a lot of times when people aren't clear on their story, they're not clear on their superpower. They're like a snowflake. They're trying to run in every direction, right? It's like they start in the middle and they're going out in eight different directions, trying to be like the fastest and the most affordable and the most convenient and all of the things rather than going in and saying, I'm all in on this one thing that I'm going to be able to say I do better than anyone in the world. 
or anyone in, you know, California or Arizona or Nevada, like wherever it is that you're serving your clients. Maybe you're like more on top of tech than anybody else. You're currently watching everything that's happening. Maybe you understand a certain industry better than anyone. Whatever it is, if there's something that you're passionate about, using that as part of your story will help you attract the right types of customers. And then that personalization part will feel even more natural because it's a combination of what you love and what they need. That's a great insight. So we're skipping around. Uh, we we better get to the E before we wrap up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Luckily, we, we can the E and the R. Through. Yes, we can go through the last two pretty quickly. E is probably my favorite. It's exceed expectations. It's all about intentional experience design. So bringing intentionality to the experiences that you have, knowing that not everything needs to be a wow. But if you take a look at all of the interactions that you have with your clients over the course of a year, where are two or three that you can really elevate that experience into something that's going to be meaningful and memorable? They're going to remember it. They're going to maybe talk about it, post about it on social media because you've exceeded their expectations. You've taken what they were expecting to be like a neutral interaction and you've made it incredible. So intentional experience design, I talk all about that in the book and how you can, how you can really bring that to your practice and, 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 you know, make it something that, that is easy to follow, easy for your team to implement. And then the R in the supermodel stands for repeat. And that's both a nod to the fact that experience is something that's never ending. You've got to bring customer centricity as a practice and a mindset every single day to everything that you do. And also it's a nod to the systems and the processes that you can use to automate some of the things, to free up more of your time, to focus on um, noticing when you have the opportunity to create a wow moment because of something that you've just heard, seen, or experienced. And you're using, you know, your, your, your the human side of you to react to that in a way that's going to be meaningful for your client. So um, back to the E, um, intentional experience design. I think that's a really powerful statement. Um, so, so if I'm, if I'm a financial advisor, then how, how do I take it from, you know, your book or this podcast level do what do, do I map out what a customer journey looks like with me, you know, so they meet me at a webinar. Uh, and then, we, you know, we have a, a discovery meeting, and then we have a qualification meeting, and then we have the closing ceremony, and, and then we have the review. So, you know, that, 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 I think that th those are the milestones in a normal advisor's process. But so, so do I, how, how do I, implement this? How do I take this off the drawing board? I mean, where do I start with with intentional experience design? Well, I'm so glad you asked, Jack. Um, yes, I absolutely recommend that people map it out. Um, there is a whole suite of resources that are free that come with my book. So if anybody buys the book, either hardcover, virtual, audiobook, there's a URL that unlocks a resource library. And one of the things in that library is a template that you can use um, for the intentional experience design process. So looking at everything that you just mentioned. And what I would say I see a lot of times is people give a disproportionate amount of attention to what I call the during process. So maybe from that, like first time you talk to a potential client through like the end of your first year with them, but they don't give as much thought to the before and the after. So what are you doing to, you know, position yourself as the right advisor fit for someone before they've picked up the phone to talk to you or before they've sent that email, essentially, like, how are you casting a great net to catch them before you even know who they are. And then after, so after, you know, wherever you define your after, is it, you know, three years, five years, you know, after you sort of are in a groove. So the intentional experience design map encompasses not just that during part, but also before and after. And yes, it's something that you can print out. Um, it's something that you can, um, in, in the template, it says like, who is responsible for this? How are we going to track the effectiveness of this? Um, how often are we going to revisit this? Uh, what would be the ROI on this? So you're actually forced to say not just, oh, wouldn't it be nice, but also here's how we're going to ensure that it gets done when, by whom, and then tracked where. And so um, obviously some of the things are, are automatic, other things you're going to have to like go in and, and, and record them and take the notes. But that's why 
bringing that intentionality is so key so that everyone on your team is aligned. As your practice grows, um, you have everyone sort of in alignment because the thing about, and the reason that I call it intentional experience design is because the question is not, is someone going to have an experience working with your firm? They absolutely are. The question is, is it going to be an intentional one that you have designed in a set way, or is it going to be a haphazard one that has a lot of variance based on, you know, the month of the year? or the advisor that they're working with or like how they engage with you. So having an intentional experience design blueprint gives you something to say, this is who we are and this is how we execute who and how we see our clients as, you know, interfacing with us in this world. Um, the, you just covered a lot of territory in a very short period of time. <laughs> so uh, I want to let our listeners know we're going to bring Brittany back for an extended session on planning. So uh, don't don't hit the panic button just yet. There'll, there'll be more resources. So um, let, let's take the customer onboarding piece uh, as a starting point. So how, how how would we think about that? I mean, I guess that for, from an advisor's perspective, the, the first question is, when does the customer onboarding piece start, right? Um, I imagine it starts, you know, with that first impression, um, you know, and, and then tracks it, it through to, you know, when you invoice them for the fees the first time, right? Absolutely. Um, and I would say it, it even goes beyond that first invoicing for the fees. I would look at the entire first year as you're onboarding every single touch in that relationship. But you're right. Customer onboarding starts the first time someone Googles you. What do they see when they Google you? How many reviews do you have? Is your website mobile optimized? Does it look great? Or have you not updated it since 1997? Are there testimonials from customers? Do you give someone an outline of what it feels like to work with you? What their process is going to look like? Is the language on your website in your own voice to resonate with the people who are going to be the best fit customers for you? All of that is part of the onboarding. So the more traditional things that we might think about onboarding um, are also incredibly important. So like that client intake questionnaire, the things that we're asking about and how we're doing it when nobody wants to just feel like they're talking to someone who's like typing in information in a form. So it's the, the personality that you bring to how you're asking those questions. Also being cognizant of like some people People might want to have a 20 minute conversation with you on the phone. Somebody else might be like, I have 90 seconds. So like, let me fill out everything I can digitally. And then like, if you need to call me for my social security number or bank account, like we can do that or whatever it is. So being intentional about the amount of options that you're willing to create at every single one of those milestone moments. So I think we underestimate um, how much time we ask clients to put into that onboarding experience. You know what I mean? And I think we tend to undervalue the investment they're making in us. I mean, if, if I've got to sit down um, and, and fill out or communicate to you either in a digital form or in a conversation, you know, all of my pertinent financial information you know, just the data points, you know, date of birth, driver's license number, you know, we've got to have that these days, all that kind of stuff. You know, that's a that's a big investment that I'm making. And if you start to think about just that little piece, um, you know, that that's I would think of that as a friction point. And mm -hmm. I imagine you've seen ways to turn that into a positive experience. I have. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is this belief I have that there are only three types of experiences that we ever have in life. At the end of any experience, whether it's short or long, we feel better, worse, or exactly the same. That's it. You're going to feel one of those three ways. You're going to be like, oh, that was faster than I thought. Great. Or, oh my gosh, I thought that was going to take 15 minutes and it took 45. Now I'm flustered because I'm behind for the rest of the day. Or you're going to be like, meh, that's about what I expected. And it's like a nothing burger that you immediately forget about. That's it. Better, worse, or the same. So part of exceeding your customer's expectations is knowing what they are. So if you are not communicating on the front end, hey, this is going to take about 25 minutes and it's going to be painful, but it's going to be worth it because like this is going to set us up for success for the next you know, five years or whatever it is. 
communicate that and find ways to your point. Like maybe you can say to somebody, Hey, we've got a lot of stuff that we've got to do over a video conference, but you know what? We're going to do it as a lunch together. So I'm going to send you a DoorDash gift card. And I want you to like order your favorite food and just set aside half an hour to like be on the phone with me. And we're going to do this. There are things that you can do to exceed someone's expectations, but you've got to be clear on what their expectations are going in. And one of the reasons that it is often a friction point is because somebody probably is not expecting it to take as long as it takes, or somebody was not clear on the fact that they needed to like have that birth certificate or social security card or driver's license or whatever in front of them. And they're like, oh, great. Well, if you had told me that I needed my passport, I would have like gone upstairs to get my passport before I got on this call, but you didn't. And now I've got to like walk up the stairs and the dogs are going to bark and whatever. So it's about making people feel prepared so they know what to expect and then exceeding those expectations however you can, whether it's with speed, whether it's with humor, whether it's with, you know, something that they're not expecting is like the cherry on the top of the end, but in some way going above and beyond what they expect. Awesome. Brittany, uh, this has been super informative and I know our advisors are going to appreciate it. They're made clamoring for more. I bet you're going to see just a little spike in book sales uh, <laughs> out of this. I uh, totally appreciate it. Uh, and we look forward to, to bringing you back, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a broader session to help our advisors understand more about how they should uh, be approaching uh, their clientele to turn them into super fans. So thank you very much, Brittany. Anything else you want to say in closing? Uh, you know, I thank you for having me, Jack. I want to say to you guys out there as advisors, you absolutely deserve super fans. You can create them. And the last thought that I'll leave you with is that when you tell someone you're a great advisor, that's just marketing. All of your competitors are doing it. You should probably be doing it too. But when your customers and your clients tell your friends, tux, <laughs> I messed that up. <laughs> do you want to just do that part again? I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. We did so good. There were like no edits for this whole thing. Okay. Thank you so much for having me, Jack. The last thought I want to leave on is this. Advisors, you deserve super fans and you can create those super fans, but it's all about the word of mouth. Everyone is an influencer. Every single one of your customers is an influencer. When you tell the world you're great, that's marketing. But when your clients tell their friends that you're great, that's magic. And that's the magic that you can absolutely harness if you follow the supermodel and bring that intentionality to every interaction that you have with your customers. Awesome. Brittany, thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed it. Looking forward to seeing you again in the future. Hey folks, this has been the Breakthrough Advisor podcast. Uh, check us out uh, on uh, Spotify, Apple, wherever you see your podcasts or surf to insuremark.net. You'll find us uh, under the Breakthrough Advisor tab. So thanks again, Brittany. Look forward to seeing you again in the future.